Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. My name is Vasily. I'm so excited to see you guys here today because today will be a special message by a special person. A person that's very near and dear to my heart. A person who's impacted my life deeply over the past few years. And I wanted to bring the message that he has in his life, the message that God has been working in through in, in his life to you guys, exactly, because you also need to hear this. My friend Jay has actually been uh, doing a lot of things for the Lord and the Lord's been working through his life. And I want to actually allow you guys to hear this message because it is wonderful what God is doing. First, I want to let him introduce himself. Well, thank you, Vasily. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, I'm Jay Berniger. I have a ministry called Power Up Ministries based here in the parish, Florida, Bradenton, Sarasota, Florida area. And uh, it's just a pleasure to be here with you. A few years ago when the Lord connected us through a mutual friend, uh, it was just a, a quick connection. And uh, I've always been blessed by your fellowship and, and your fire uh, to serve God, serve Jesus, a big soul winner. And anyone that's a soul winner wants to be, I want to be a friend of theirs. So Amen. I want to help Come you. On. It's a blessing to be here with you today. Amen. Thank you. You know, Jay, throughout the conversations that we've had, we've had many different deep conversations. And a lot of it has been uh, what God has been doing in your life in the past and how God's been working through my life and the similarities and the differences. And you just see the, the like, God is not a God who's stuck in one generation. He's not a God who's just stuck in, into, like, one little niche of people like, oh, this is just for the evangelist or this is just for the preacher. No, God is a God that transcends all that stuff and he wants to see an open vessel. And I just want to to bring you back, bring us back to the beginning of your life. You know, whenever, uh, beginning of your spiritual life, not not your actual life, but whenever um, the Lord actually touched your life that you decided that, okay, I'm going to serve you. And, you know, there's a lot of the, to that story, but I want to actually see like where your vessel like was freed for him to use you in that moment. Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and I appreciate it because um, the way I was raised, I was raised in an American Baptist home. We went to a First Baptist Church in Plainfield, and um, I graduated from high school in 1972. I got away from the Lord, got into drugs like a lot of people did back in the 70s, uh, become a drug dealer. But in the midst of all of that, I fell into just a dark hole, uh, uh, just a dark pit. I had, I had been baptized when I was 12 years old totally got away from the Lord with the drug culture, but I never stopped believing in God. There was something in my heart that I knew God was still real, but I was out doing anything but living for Him. And I moved to Bedford, Indiana. I had a grandmother who went to the Baptist church, um, uh, actually where I was born, and she was a praying grandmother. Thank God for praying grandmothers. Amen. You know, Come on. Grandmothers keep on praying. You yes. Know? Uh, don't give up if you're praying for your lost one, loved ones and your prodigals, because I was the prodigal son, and my grandmother loved me with an unconditional love. Every year, that's, this church had um, a revival. Every September, they had a revival, a week of revival. But there was something, as I, as I watched her, and the pastor would always stop and see me, he'd always, you know, say, anything I can pray with you about, you know, just a, a man that loved God and, and never judged me, never condemned me, never told me what kind of sinner I was because he knew I already knew. But, <laughs> but they were doing something different. And this is important. And I'm, I'm, I've actually written this entire story. It's going to be in my new book coming up. How I got saved and how that revival impacted it, and the entire community is what we're seeing happen now. And this is important because they were having weekly prayer meetings for months. And in those weekly prayer meetings, they were meeting in people's homes. They were praying. They were lifting up the community. They had lists of people who were sick, people like me that were backslidden and away from the Lord. And when they started having that meeting, um, at that time, I was a police officer. And the pastor's son and I used to go out and party and drink all the time. And I went over to his house at the parsonage during the week of the revival on a Tuesday night. And ask him if he wanted to go out and have a drink, smoke a joint, whatever. And he went, no, I don't. No, I now, don't. this was on September 20th, 1978. Yeah. Okay. Think about the dates. So September 20th, 1978. Almost 20 years before I was born. Uh, yeah, there you go. Yes. You hadn't been thought about yet. No, I was not. <laughs> so uh, he said, no, he didn't. And what I found out was on that Tuesday night, he had given his life to Jesus Christ and he was sold out, totally born again, just full of God. And he told me, he said, you know, we go out and we drink and we shoot pool in the bars and you tell people about Jesus. You tell people we're going to hell if we don't get right with God. And you know the truth. 
You just need to give your life back to the Lord. Come on. Well, what he didn't know was that for months, I would stand in the door of, of my grandmother's house. The church was across the street. And I would watch people pull in, get out, hugging each other and talking. And I would stand there and cry. Were you jealous of them? I wanted, I wanted to go home. Come on. I wanted to get back to God so bad. Wow. I didn't know how. I didn't know how. I, I was no different than people today, brother. Yeah. People want to get to God, and they don't know how. When you do studies of revival history where people had a sudden awareness of God and a sudden awareness of His love and His goodness and His, His holiness— and then realize their own sinful lost state. They begin to cry out to God, and they want to get home, and they don't know how to get back to him. Okay? Well, that's where I was at. So I went to work that night, sat in an alley at 5.30 in the morning. I said, Lord, I'm going back to church tonight. My exact words were, Lord, tonight you get me back. Wow. I went home. I slept all day. I got up. I went to church service. I still remember the evangelist preached about God's unconditional love. And it was like nobody else was there. And I, I, was, I went for one purpose, to give my life to Jesus. And there's one other thing I need to point out to people just so you understand where I was at. For probably two years, this had been going on in me. And I used to, I had a Bible, and I would come home drunk, two, three o'clock in the morning, stoned out of my mind and get my Bible and hold it next to my chest and wow. cry myself to sleep. I'd open it up and try to find where's the answers. I knew answers was in that book, but I didn't know how to find them. Wow. So don't stop praying for people. Don't stop praying for, for your lost loved ones, your friends, your neighbors, the co-workers, because God's working in people's lives. It's almost like your grandma's prayers were like creating a soil inside of you for they the Holy were. Spirit to deposit something in. Like it created a dependency on God that you were not, you didn't realize. Because before this, you really didn't care. And all of a sudden, that feeling of, I need the Lord, started to over, like just overtake your, your spirit and your soul. You started to feel that deprivation of, you need God. You didn't know how to get to Him, but you saw it. And I feel like those were the, those were the seeds that were laid by your grandma's prayers from the beginning. Well, and another layer of this about the prayers is my mom was still going to that Baptist church in Plainfield, Indiana. And every Wednesday, there was a women's Bible study prayer group that would meet on Wednesday mornings and pray. And I was on their prayer list for six years. That is so powerful to me to think that I had my, my grandmother praying for me, my mom praying for me, and some of those women that were in that prayer meeting with my mom, they later become members of the church I was pastoring. Wow. I ended up pastoring those families. <laughs> that is that is such a, let's go around the full circle. Go into a loop, come on. You know, and, and I just talked to one of those ladies here recently. She's about oh, 78 years old, and, and I got in touch with her, and we just got caught up and talked. But wow. The wonderful family. But but when I went when I went to church that night, they preached that message, and as soon as they started, they were singing Amazing Grace. And as soon as they started, I hit the aisle. And I didn't get three steps that I was broken, mm. totally weeping, uncontrollable weeping, crying. And I ran. Wow. I ran to the altar. I didn't walk. I ran. The title, I wrote this in my, in my new book. This whole story is in my book. Mm -hmm. And I called it, the, t the name of that chapter is called, I Met Him at the Altar. Wow. Because I truly had an awareness of God in my life. I knew about God. I believed in Jesus. But I didn't have that relationship, that intimate, I'm going to serve you, Jesus. I'm sold out. You know, we ask, I, I don't pray with people anymore this way. I don't pray for people to ask Jesus into their hearts. I pray with them that they give their heart and life to him and make a choice to follow him the rest of their lives from their heart. There's a big difference. Yeah. Big difference. If I give him my heart, everything in me goes with that. If I ask him to come into my heart, I can turn it into compartments. I'll let you have that part of my heart, but not this part of my heart. 
And that means he doesn't have any of us yeah. at that point. Mm -hmm. So it's either all or none. It's all or none. I was praying or I was crying and weeping so hard that when the pastor of the church was Lewis Williams, a, a wonderful man who loved the Lord. He's, he's with Jesus now, praise God. But he was praying with me and I couldn't talk. I, all I could do is cry and nod, you know, and they prayed with me. And then they normally took people back to the back to shake hands. And he said, you want to go back? And I was like, no, I, I had something else happen. This is why I know Jesus met me at that altar. Yeah. My godly sorrow, which works repentance and the goodness of God that brought me through all of the junk that I've been living through, brought me through all the drugs, the alcohol, the drunkenness, times I should have been car wrecked in a ditch. He took care of me. He was answering all those people's prayers. And my godly sorrow and repentance, suddenly I was filled with joy. Wow. I had a joy. I had a peace. I felt a warmth and a love of God that was so overwhelming to me and has overwhelmed me ever since. That's why I gave him my heart and he met me there and said, you're giving me your life. I gave you mine, you're giving me yours, and he just hugged me. It was just like Jesus hugged me. Well, then I was crying and laughing at the same time. And then, you know, you don't do a lot of hugging people in a Baptist church. Yeah. But they joked about this for a long time. I hugged everybody. I was out in the parking lot hugging people. They accused me of hugging trees and telephone poles. I don't know if that's true, but oh, goodness. overwhelmed. And that's how I chose to follow him was that night, September 21st, 1978 in a Baptist church in Needmore, Indiana. Come on. See, that the thing is, like, with every single story that I hear and with every person I come across, even my own story, desperation causes an awakening in your spirit. Like, you cannot, yes, you can receive Jesus just a temporary, like, com uh, contemporary way where you just kind of walk and, like, you can receive the Lord. But the people whose lives have been marked significantly by God are those that are desperate for everything they have. They give up everything for the Lord and they take on God in the fullness that God is. You know, like even like for myself, like I lived a perfect, pure like Christian life that felt like it was okay-ish uh, for 23 years. But it wasn't until I was 23 years old when I realized that that I am actually broken. I'm, I'm depressed. I'm completely addicted to different things in my life. And without Jesus, I'm not able to do it. I, I did it with religion for 23 years, but until I got Jesus, I was not able to do it. I never went into drugs. I never went into different things, but I was addicted to video games. I was addicted to pornography. I couldn't get away from those things, and yet I was married, and yet I was trying to build a family, and yet we were going to work, and yet I was trying to, to have Bible studies at my house, being a good spiritual leader, and I was a horrible one because I didn't have him. And because whenever I got desperate for him, he came and he filled that desperation. It says, it says, blessed are those that are hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. If we don't thirst for him, if we don't, are, not, are not hungry for him, then we're hungry for something else or we're full of ourselves. Well, I agree with you. And, and my experience, which is my experience, everybody has their experience. Um, the next morning, I went over to the, to the pastor's house that was on a, that was on a Thursday night, and I went over to the pastor's house and I said I want to be baptized Sunday, and he said Yeah, but you were baptized when you were younger, and I said I know, but I said I want the complete, I want to complete this journey, this package, and I know that I need to really identify that the old man, the old Jay Brenninger, died Thursday night. Yes, and the new Jay Brenninger walking in newness of life, recreated an image and likeness of God with his divine nature. I want to, I want to identify with his, with his death, burial, and resurrection. I want to identify with that because I'm going to follow him. And uh, the pastor's son and myself and several other people were all baptized that Sunday morning. Wow. And we immediately, uh, his name was Doug Williams. Doug's with, with the Lord now too. But Doug and I became soul winners right away. We just, we were just, nuts. we didn't know nothing. I couldn't tell you what John 3.16 was, <laughs> but everybody in the whole community knew I was a heathen. Yeah. Everybody knew I, had, I was a heathen. And the heathen got saved and the building didn't cave in on everybody. And it, I was a story. And then Doug was a story. So we were suddenly being invited to go to different churches and youth groups and give our testimony, mm -hmm. what God did for us. And everybody was, was amazed what, what happened to these guys.
because we were truly not just born again, but we became true followers, disciples yes. of wow. Jesus. Wow, that's amazing. So I want to take you, I want to go from this story in, into what happened further into your life. See, um, you were known for something. You you are known for something amazing. Like whenever I first met you, it was. I was trying to meet up with and get advice on how to do crusades and local outreaches. And they're like, you need to talk to Jay because of what God has done in you in Indiana and uh, right in Indiana. Yeah. And so I always mess, mess up those two, Indiana and Indianapolis. Or, uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. Yeah, yeah and just always. <laughs> I'm just like, what, what, which one did I say? But Indiana. And I want, to, I want to speak about how did you go from just being a person that's just got saved, everything else, and then how did the Lord birth that desire into that vessel of you that, hey, I need to do more for God. I need to do more. And what did that more look like? You know, uh, Patty and I, we, we've been married now 43 years. We were married in 1980, and we started pastoring a church in 1981 uh, in southern Indiana. We were ordained in January of 1970, 1982, excuse me. And uh, we moved to Indianapolis in 1983. Uh, through a number of circumstances. And uh, we started a church in 1984, a new church plant. That church uh, grew. And in 1986, um, we, were, we were meeting uh, on, on Saturday nights in a church building. They had s- Sunday services, but we, they let us use their sanctuary on Sunday nights, or Saturday nights. And uh, we moved in. We, we had to move out because we outgrew their sanctuary. It was a small church, and we were booming. And so we went uh, to the Holiday Inn at the airport on the west side of Indianapolis, and we're renting a big conference room. And the Lord had me do something. There was a couple of things that led up to what you're asking me about, and these are very critical times. Yeah, We need to understand that in Galatians 4.4 it says, In the fullness of time, God brought forth his son, born of a virgin, born under the law. Mm-hmm. And we look at the Bible, and throughout the Bible, we see where there was appointed times, there was the fullness of times, and it's amazing stories. And we realize that God is taking us into a direction. He has a goal. He has a plan. Like Abram became Abraham, who became the father of many nations. But if you look at just his life, God even told him that same day, you know, that your your people are going to come into bondage for 400 years. Yeah. All of a sudden, he's telling Moses, he didn't have any kids yet, but he's saying, you're, you're Abraham. You're, or Abraham, uh, he's telling Abraham, your, your people are going to come into bondage, and I'm going to deliver them. Yeah. And he didn't even have a child yet, you know. And, but there was a time. So yes. when we went to Indianapolis, we had God had us have a communion service at our church, not a normal communion service. We normally had every first Sunday of the month we had communion, but this was an entire service. We had that communion service for three hours. It did not stop. People were taking multiple communions. They took a communion by themselves. Then they were taking it with their spouses, with their families. The teenagers were having communion with each other. What did that look like? Who was speaking for the communion? Was it just natural? Well, we started out, we had a couple of songs for worship. It was it was worship. We got into worship. The presence of God was there. And then I talked a little bit about communion because I had already told them what we were going to do, so they were prepared. We had a lot of communion prepared. Um, and because our church at that time was about 60 people, so we had communion set for a whole lot more than that because we knew multiple communions would take place. And uh, also part of that was if someone in the church has offended you or hurt you or you know you've offended or hurt someone, you said something in a wrong tone or whatever it could be, wow. go to them, apologize, and allow yourselves to have healing. Don't harbor anything. Don't go, well, it's no big deal. If you're thinking about it, it's a big enough deal that it needs to be dealt with. So we went for three hours in a communion service. And what that did, Vaselli, is it brought us into a relationship that was covered in the love of Jesus. Wow. We, 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 we transformed our church that day. And Jesus, the Holy Ghost, did it because we suddenly had this love for one another, 
among one another, a love and an intimacy with Jesus, and we had that intimacy with him as a group of people. That was, that was crucial for what you're asking about. Um, though, I, as you're talking, this one uh, verse that comes up to my mind is, therefore they, they will know you for the love that you have for one another. Yeah. John 17. It's, love in itself is um, God himself. Yes. And uh, communion says, therefore do this in remembrance of me. And as you were doing that, that communion service in remembrance of Jesus, the love of Jesus came into the room and the whole entire church was transformed and the love for each other grew. Yes, it's exactly like, what happened. And that's exactly, like, that was, that's the only way that I could think that that could be possible. Yes. So the communion becomes very important, and we can talk about that later, but that communion service changed our church. Yeah. That was in 1986. In 1987, we had bought a building uh, that we could use as a church. And the Lord had me do something else. So one year later, he tells me to have a foot washing service. Now, I had never been in one. I had heard about them. I had never experienced it. So I talked to some of my Pentecostal friends, Pentecostal <laughs> pastors that knew about that. And uh, so I said, okay, fine. I taught about it, talked about it. Because when Jesus washed the feet of the apostles, you know, he, he showed us what a servant leader is. He said, if, if you don't allow me to wash your feet, you have no part of me. Yeah. That's a huge statement. So I wash people's feet. They wash my feet. They wash each other's feet. It was an amazing time. I watched people weep. I watched people was getting their feet washed, sit and cry. I watched people wow. doing the washing, cry and weep over their feet. And it was older people, it was younger people, it was teenagers. And it was families would go to another family and they'd all wash the feet of another family. Whole families came to wash my feet, my wife's feet as pastors wow. of the church. It was overwhelming. Well, if you stop and think, who does he give grace to? To the humble. When mm -hmm. we humble ourselves, he gives us his grace. Yeah. And when we think about the ministry gifts, he gives us gifts. Whatever those ministry gifts are, those spiritual gifts are, they all operate with the grace. He gives us the grace according to the gift. Without the grace, the gift of an, an anointed pastor, whatever, it doesn't matter if you don't have the grace to function. And the way we destroy the grace is to get prideful and arrogant and self-important. We have to stay empty. We have to stay broken. We have to stay humble in order to maintain the grace level to function in the gifts and the callings that he's given to us. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. So what happened to our church? We went from this loving church, and, and it stuck. It absolutely stuck. We, we stayed in that atmosphere of love. And then... The next year when we did the foot washing, we went from loving to serving. That then sets us up for a whole nother level to your question about the crusade in Indianapolis, which was called Love March 88. Wow. Because in 19, late 87, after the foot washing, every end of the year, I, as a pastor, I would always be praying about where are you taking us next year, Lord? What do, we need, what do I need to be preparing for, studying for, praying into. And so in, in that prayer time, he told me to call the church into a 10-day fast in January. And our church, said we would fast, but never for 10 days, maybe one day, two days, three days, you know, as a church, but never anything like this. So I taught about fasting. I taught about prayer. We prepared. The congregation was extremely excited about this. So in January of 1988, we entered into a 10-day time of prayer and fasting. And it was very committed. The people were committed to this. It wasn't just me and a few others. It was everybody got in, even the teenagers were involved, wow. okay? And in the middle of that, Rod Parsley, maybe people have heard of Rod Parsley, pastor a big church in Columbus, Ohio. Um, Rod came to Indianapolis and had a crusade. There was a couple thousand people in a big Holiday Inn meeting room. And we were all there. I think about everybody in my church was there. And in the middle of his sermon, I began to have an open vision. Wow. And in this open vision, I saw thousands of people walking down Meridian Street in downtown Indianapolis down to Monument Circle. Monument Circle, when they established the city of Indianapolis, 
city of Indianapolis circle is literally the center of everything. It has a street north and south and a street running east and west. And those streets intersect around the circle going around monument, around the wow. monument that's there. So when we got down there, the Lord showed me trumpet players facing north, south, east, and west. Yeah. And there was quietness, and then there was something, a, a decree, something took place. When that decree was made, they began to blow the trumpets, and the people began to shout and praise and worship God. And then in the vision, there was an explosion Wow. That took, an absolute explosion that took place in the spirit realm. Wow. And and then this revival would break out in Indianapolis and across Indiana, and it would spread across the country. Yes. And so I, as we can, this was like on day five of our fast. I continued that fast, and about a week later, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, this is what you shall decree. You shall decree the great Indianapolis revival is underway. Yeah. This turned out to be exactly, I wrote the vision, I wrote the entire vision over the next three weeks, every day in prayer, still fasting, God was telling me more and more. I went to pastors, I went to area leaders, everyone that I shared this vision with, they all said, this is God, yes, they were excited because it was an ecumenical move. Yeah. Everybody left their denomination names behind, their titles behind. We dropped everything. Come on. We came together as body, as body of Christ. And we just loved one another. We served one another. We were focused on Jesus. And, and it came to pass. I mean, when, when, I, when, when I go you know, into the details of what happened, it's, like, it's tremendous. It's like John chapter 17, verse 20. It's, Father, let them know you. Sorry. Father, let them be one, just as you and I are one. I and them, I and you, you and me, and them and us, so that the world may know that you sent the Christ and that Christ could be glorified. The world cannot know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, if we're not standing together. Unity is a big drive factor in evangelism. I've seen that a lot in my life. But guys, if you are enjoying this podcast right now, I want to, uh, this episode specifically with Jay, I want to thank you, thank Jay for being here, but I also want you to share this podcast, share this episode with one of your best friends. Tell them what God is doing in this video so that they can also be impacted too. And picking up right where we left off, Jay, like the fact that the Spirit of God moves us, number one, into unity. Like, it brings us closer to himself. It unifies us with God. Then it unifies us with each other. And then it sends us to the streets. Like, even before, before Jesus uh, left, he said, he said, stay in the upper room because you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. The people stayed together. They were on one accord. Let's, let's talk about that. One accord. And once they were in one accord, then the Holy Spirit came upon them in a certain in a appointed time. <laughs> in the point in time, the Holy Spirit came upon them. And then what happened? 3,000 souls were saved. Why? They were in one accord. Because they were one accord and the Holy Spirit was there. Unity drives everything. So you saw this vision. You saw the explosion of spirit. You saw how people were coming. No denominations. No, no bodies of, 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 of church leaders that were leading the whole thing. But it was led by God, for God. And what happened after that? Well, we started coming together. Part of the vision was the Lord showed me to have uh, TV programs and all of the pastors that were involved. We would get a lot of them on TV, and we would talk about what God was doing. Um, we did radio programs, and the buildup, the anticipation was tremendous. And uh, Dr. Summerall got behind it, uh, Trinity Broadcasting Network, Jan Paul Krauss got behind it, and churches and people were just excited. And what you were just talking about, the one accord, the, the body, the believers, they want to be the body of believers. They, yes. they, they're they hungry for one accord. I think they're more hungry now than they were in 1988, and we were hungry then. And so we, we came together, we did all of this, and on uh, July 30th, 1988, we gathered in downtown Indianapolis. God gave us favor on everything over and over and over. It was just, it just, just laid out in front of us. What did you... Um just because I'm in the middle of this stuff right now as well. How did you present it even to the pastors whenever you talk to the pastors, to the leaders? How did you present coming together on one accord? 
Yeah, because there's a like there's a big factor of even like right now individuals are watching this. They have a heart to do something for God, but they don't even know how to address it to people to other people so that they could pull them in as well. I think that uh, the pastors. Well, first of all, I was I was known in the area where, where pastors, other pastors. I mean, we fellowship. We got together once a month, and and uh, at least once a month, and some more than that. And we were in fellowship. Uh, we had Lutherans, Presbyterians. Uh, we had a Catholic, Spirit-filled Catholic nun, uh, Assembly of God, Church of God, Charismatics. We were meeting once a month because we all just felt the need, and we did that for several years. I mean, I think I think the first time I went to that meeting was in 1981. I was mm -hmm. invited to go with my pastor before I was actually in the ministry, but I went. So they knew me, and they knew that if I came and said I had something, they were going to take heed to it <clears throat> and pray about it. And, you know, when God's in something and you're talking to other people, you're not trying to sell them on anything. You're sharing a vision, and they either bear witness to it or they don't. Yeah. If they bear witness to it, they'll, they'll become involved with it. If they don't bear witness, they will make excuses, I'm too busy, whatever, and they'll go down the road. Um, we didn't have any of that happen. Wow. We didn't have anybody too busy. They were all busy, but they all said, this is a priority for our city, for our state, for our region, for the country. They understood the significance of it. Wow. And when you read the entire vision, when I wrote it, because I wrote the vision, you know, Habakkuk 2.2 2 says, write the vision, make it plain so he who reads it can run. And that's what we did. We wrote the vision. Wow. I wrote it out before anything had happened. Here's what God showed me. And what's amazing is, on the day of the march, that morning, it was raining. Now, we have four or five blocks north of the circle. We have big PAs being set. That was the rally point. And thousands of people are gathering with umbrellas, with raincoats, with wow. plastic over them. They, they gathered in the rain, but Sally, yeah. nobody cared it was raining. Come on. They just kept coming. And I was, I was, I was in tears. I was, I'm thinking the whole thing may be wrecked. And, and I told someone, someone said, well, you think people will show up? I said, I know this. Me, you, and Jesus showed up. I know what he showed me. I know what he showed me. And I would not back off, even in, when it was pouring down the rain. The praise and worship team got down there. They were worshiping God in the rain. Come on. Nobody stopped. We're here to lift up Jesus over our city, and we're not fair with our Christians, so let's get on with it. Yeah, who cares about uh, the who rain? Cares? Who cares uh, about the rain? Cares? Okay, you can change your clothes, but you cannot change your soul. And, and, and if we really want to stop raining, then tell it to stop raining in Jesus' name, and it'll stop raining exactly. and move on. So, but you it, want it to be nice and cool the whole day. But what we did, everybody, we were because we had mics, so we started talking. Well, we prayed. Now you got several thousand people in agreement that this rain's going to move off. We called for the clouds to dissipate. We called for the sun come to come on. forth. We called for blue skies. And when you watch the videos, we got videos of this today. Come when on. you watch the videos, you see it raining and people with rain gear. <laughs> and then you see sunshine and blue skies. And at That's 12 amazing. noon, we start marching. Come on, and Lord. Steve Summerall's Lester's son is interviewing me. And it's blue sky, sunshine. And we marched. And with Sally, just watching the people march, we had between four and 5,000 people wow. show up. And they get down, they got around the circle, and I got up there, uh, we made the decree, we did what God told us to do. And the trumpets blew, I said, let the great Indianapolis revival begin, and those people began to shout, brother. I mean, they shouted. And the power of God, the glory of God fell. I mean, fell on all of us. We yeah. had over 200 salvations. We had people in parking garage. We yeah. had test boys came in for months. People in parking garage, we gave an altar call after we were just soaking in the, the glory of God. Then we gave an altar call and people bowed in the parking garages next to their cars yeah. and prayed the prayer of repentance and got saved. Come on. One family had a teenage boy came with him. They made him come. He was a drug user. They made him come. She, the mother told me the story later. When the power of God fell, he was tripping on LSD. Right before he left, he took a, head of, a hit of LSD. Now, I've, I've done LSD. I know what that is. You're, you're up for 24 hours. You're tripping. You're hallucinating. I know what that's like. And this kid 
17 years old, 16, I think 16 years old, is tripping. And it's three hours into this trip, he's hallucinating. And when the power of God hit, they're standing down by the street, the power of God hit him and knocked him out on the pavement. Wow. He was out, the Sally, and they, everybody was worshiping and praying. And about 20 minutes went by, the kid then sets up, gets up on his feet, and looks at his mom and dad, and he's talking in tongues. He got saved, born again, filled the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues, and was no longer tripping. The Holy Ghost just cleansed him of everything, Come everything. On. And this is the kind of things we had people healed. We had people filled the Holy Ghost. Nobody's praying for anybody. It's just the Holy Ghost Hallelujah. moving, pouring out, pouring Hallelujah. out. Come on. And so what happened then is... <clears throat> That impacted the churches all around the area, congregations. I just literally, a week and three days ago, was in Indianapolis preaching about the Love March 88 at a, at a big prayer conference. And what I realized with Sally a couple of years ago, I, was, I found this old VHS video, mm -hmm. and I was watching it. I didn't even know I had it. I found an old VHS player. I plugged it in. I didn't even know if it would work. I was amazed I was able to plug it into my TV. I, was, I didn't know that I was that techie. And, and I played it and I began to weep. Wow. I just wept in the presence of God. And the Holy Spirit said to me, Jay, it's still alive. Come on. Two years ago. It's still alive. What is still alive? The decree that you made in the fullness of time, son, wow. I bring forth my revival. That's powerful. Wow. That's God. Only God does this. This isn't a man thing. This is a God thing. Yeah. So we then, because the revival spread, I was then going to other places in Indiana doing the same thing. We went for four years to places like Tacoma, Washington, um, Detroit, Michigan. Uh, Flint, Michigan, Jackson, Michigan, different places in Indiana, and everywhere we went. The churches we organized, we, we traveled, we went, we pulled pastors and churches together. How long did you spend in each city? Uh, a week. By a week. It was a week. And um, in Detroit, Detroit was, was awesome. The, the churches and pastors in the whole Detroit area, I mean, it was the whole area, Sterling Heights, and everywhere got involved. We did a big march in downtown Mm -hmm. um, uh, Detroit, the mayor, Andrew Young at that time, sent out a decree and made a declaration, Detroit for Jesus Day. Come on. I have a copy of it. <laughs> um, um, and every city we went to, God poured out his spirit. And uh, well, we had over 1,200 salvations at Detroit. Wow. And none of them in church services. Come on, Lord. None in church services. Everything on the streets. Everything on the street. And we had, we won a gang called the Young Guns in Detroit. You won them? We won them to the Lord, and we had it all on video. Jesus. And, and it's amazing because two of those guys, the, the, the SWAT team was going to bust them. They were talking to us on the street, and the SWAT team pulled up, jumped out of their unmarked vans, black vans, black windows. I mean, these guys look like Navy SEALs, and they got out with all their gear, put those guys up on a wall. They shook them all down, trying to find guns, knives, drugs, found nothing, told them to get on down the street. And I said, okay, guys, see ya. They got in their vans and they disappeared. A little bit later, about 20 minutes gone by, those, those guys came back because we was in this little Hispanic church. It was a small little church. They had a food pantry, giving out food and clothes. They came back. They walked in the door. Wow. And they walked up to us and said, we want to know what happened. What do you mean? What, what happened? And they went, well, he's got a gun in his pocket. He had a gun and a knife in his pocket. We all had drugs in our pocket. We had pot in our pockets. We had stuff in our pants. We actually felt them put their, the cops put their hands on the guns, the knives, and the drugs and felt nothing. Explain this. How did we not get arrested? And so it was very easy then to, to pray with them, explain to them what Jesus had done, how much God loved them, that he was giving them a chance to give their lives to him. And nine of those guys, nine of those gang members prayed with us. Two of those guys would a year later enter into the ministry Come and, on. and become pastors. This is what happened. Drugs disappeared. <laughs> That's yeah. amazing. So uh, like what would happen to these Jesus marches? 
What would well, you see? What 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 happens is a lot of lead up. It, there's a lot of anticipation. The the hunger in the hearts are no different today than they were in 1988. Yeah. Or 1808. It doesn't make any difference. Uh, we are we are humans. We are people with the same hearts, emotions, and, and human makeup. And people were hungry when we would sit down and say, aren't you tired of competing against each other? Aren't you pastors? And it was, it was addressed to the pastors. Aren't you tired of the competition? Aren't you tired of rotating congregations? When will you realize that God's called us to be one body? Yeah. And when we become one, and, and here, here's, here's, the key, here's the key answer to your question. And it's not easy, but it is the key answer. We have to die to ourselves. We have to do what Jesus said. If we want to follow him and we want to be in one accord, we have to die to our mm. selfish ambitions, to our goals, to our what we're trying to accomplish, what we want to do. It's not about what I want to do or what I don't want to do. It's not about where I want to go or I don't want to go. Where he wants to go. It's where he wants to go. And you make a choice when you say, I want, I want to be like Jesus. Really? He got crucified. You're going to pick up your cross and die too. And he said, follow me. Pick up your cross and follow me. He was saying, you have to die like me. Yeah. And if you'll die like me and follow me, you'll do things like I've done, and greater works will you do, because I'm going to the Father, and you'll also have eternal life. Wow. So this lasted for you for four years? Well, it's still going on. That was the first four years. The yeah. first four years. And then you transitioned from the Jesus Marches. What did you do after the Jesus Marches? Well, I did some, I did some foreign missions. We went over to um, Brazil, South America. I was preaching in a lot of churches. I really focused a shift. A shift was to start teaching and training God's people how to evangelize because they didn't do it. They were afraid to do it. Uh, they didn't know why to do it. They didn't know how to do it. It was just um, a, a little bit like what we're in today um, where we don't have soul winning. And so we, I put together a syllabus and a training. Yeah. And I traveled around the country then doing evangelism conferences and doing street ministry. We had a TV program. We planted another church on the north side of Indianapolis. And that church was focused on evangelism training. We would have people from other churches come to our church for evangelism training. They'd go back to their towns and do evangelism. And I, um, I had built a, uh, the Lord told me, I really got me out of my comfort zone, but told me to, to build a 10-foot cross and begin to carry it on the streets. Wow. And that really, as a pastor, you know, pastors are very comfortable in their pulpits. Yes. And they should be. I don't, I don't say that in a derogatory way at all. They should be comfortable. They should be confident in their pulpit, ministering to God's people that he's assigned them to. But when you take them out of that, Paul told Pastor Timothy to do the work of Pastor an evangelist. Timothy. Pastor Timothy. Pastor Timothy. Timothy was in pastoral ministry when yes. Paul wrote to Timothy and said, I just never, I've never heard somebody say Pastor Timothy before. Right. There you have now. <laughs> I love new. it. Because he was pastoring people. Yeah. They, they didn't all go out and, and create born-again believers and then leave them to Satan's devices. You know, there were elders and they, they had teachers and apostles and prophets and evangelist pastors that were helping I mean, in people. reality speaking, like I'm an evangelist, I'm comfortable on the streets. A lot of people are not. You're an evangelist, you're comfortable winning souls, you're comfortable going out to the streets, you're comfortable doing all that stuff. Why? Because we're like, this is what we do, it's who we are. But... You know, a pastor has to be comfortable in the church. They have to be okay with, with being in front of the stage. They have to be okay with those quiet moments. They have to be okay with that. You know, I I want to I want to move this into yeah. like a into a little switch that I just felt in my heart mm -hmm. uh, to share. You had you were doing all these things. What was your prayer life like? Because you we see the public reward a lot for the deep intimacy we have. I wanted to just dig deep into your into your heart, Jay. What was your prayer life like whenever you were doing those mar marches in all those places and God was moving, people were getting saved left and right. What was your prayer life like? Because, you know, sometimes we get to a success point. We're like, oh, we don't need to pray as much because we're we're doing it and we're working. So what's, what's that uh, prayer life like for you? Well, when I was pastoring 
prior to Love March, um, I always went to, I, to me, I went to the church every day. I know a lot of pastors don't, but that was my office. Yeah. And, and that's how I looked at it. And, and I, went to the, I went to the church building every day. I had an office at the church. Um, a lot of days, I, I would say I, I spent six hours a day in the Word and prayer. Um, I had a time every day in the morning, many in the afternoon, where I went to the sanctuary. I got down my face at the altar in the sanctuary and sought God. And I always kept a prayer journal. I always wrote down notes or scriptures. Um, you know, it was in, in from, from my perspective, I couldn't get, I mean, I, I could go pick out number, you know, sermon number 37. I could go buy prayer sermon books or I could get before God and say, Lord, what's your word for my people yeah, so you that I'm really, responsible for? So I prayed a lot. And I, so you were dependent on him in prayer. I, I, I couldn't do it without him. Mm -hmm. I had nothing without him. I, had, I, was, I was nothing before him. And anything I was when I found him was because of him. I feel like many, uh, many people, they get a call, a call into their life. God gives them a big vision. And they, they just start working for the vision rather than working to the secret place. You know, we don't work for Jesus. We work with Jesus. Exactly. And, and we don't walk alone. We walk with him. It's the reason why it's called the commission, not the mission. Yeah. Yeah, really. That's a good word. Yeah, there's a reason why it's a co, two and one, yeah. not mission. Because we're all giving the mission, but without the Holy Spirit, it's just a mission. It's a commission for a reason. You know, there's a, there's a scripture I turned to it earlier, and this scripture is in, in Ezekiel 33. Yeah. It's a story when, when Moses and God, uh, Moses is wanting God's presence and he's wanting God's glory. And and in that scripture, he... Ezekiel or Exodus? Exodus, what did I say? You said Ezekiel. Oh, I, said, I said, wait a second, I know that yeah. verse like the back of my hand. Yeah. That's Exodus, my friend. <laughs> you know, God answered his prayer and said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And then Moses in Exodus 33, 15 says, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. Yeah. This mm. is this is so real in my life right now. If I don't have his presence, I I know by faith he dwells yeah. in me. I know by faith. I'm not talking about making a faith statement. I want to know that my life is without sin. I want to know that my life has no presumptuous sin in it that I need to repent of. I want my life to be as a place where there's nothing in me that ever offends him that would ever have him draw his presence and his awareness away from me. If I don't have his presence, I can't minister on the street. I can't teach in a pulpit. I am totally on my own. And if I'm on my own and it's just me, then the people I'm praying with or speaking to might as well just go home. I have nothing for them without his presence. Yeah. I love the fact that it says um, right before that, it's, uh, where, where does it say exactly? But it says, specifically Moses says, if your presence doesn't go with us, how will they know? Yeah. How will they know yeah. that we are your chosen people? Yeah. Like, if we do not, like, I, I bring it to whenever I do evangelism trainings nowadays and vital gatherings in churches and whenever we travel, I bring it back to the basics. Like, guys, we are not, like, Jesus in Luke chapter chapter um, 10, whenever he sends the 70 out, he says specifically, go, uh, therefore, but do not take do not take your money back, do not take your sandals, do not take your um, na uh, nap, nap packs either. Uh, why? Because... I look at it like we we try to make our um, we try to pay for our way uh, with our money our money bags. We try to make our own steps. We try to even like our knapsacks. Like I think about it as like past wisdom, past experiences. Like knapsack is like the person that like person that's carrying a hitch you know a hitchhiker. It's whatever their belongings are. And God's like leave everything behind, go your way, and enter a city and sit, and what's called find somebody at peace. Like He's literally saying to them like don't worry about anything. You go, I'll take care of the rest because I'm with you. But whenever we go and we pay for our own things, we, we, we form our own path, we do, do everything. Then we're like, wait, where is God? I did this vision, I'm doing it. Where is God? And God's like, you did all of this without me. <laughs> all of this stuff you did, but I've been in the background. And so that's why I was pulling you back into the prayer life is because even for myself, with all the visions that God says in my life, and a lot of people don't even know half the things that me and you talk about, but all of that drives me deeper into a secret place because I cannot do it without him. 
I cannot go out and do pastors meetings and meetings with leaders. It doesn't make sense to me because I get before people. When I get before people, it's not me getting before people. It's the word of the Lord is getting before people. And then I'm there to represent it. Our, our prayer life, and you, you said two key words there. Secret place. Yeah. When when I, I, I will pray with people, my wife and I will pray, but I need my time. It's when I get along with him and uh, I, I, he wakes me up at three and four o'clock in the morning. Sometimes I lay there in bed and I know certain things to pray about. And then sometimes I know I have to get up and go to my office and get my nose in the carpet. Mm -hmm. Sometimes on the way to my office in the house, because that's where my office you is. You can't at. even make it there. I well, I sometimes I don't. I usually do, but I usually go by the kitchen and get uh, everything for communion. Oh wow! And I, and I do communion a lot. And see, when we're talking about secret place, this is so important, Miss Sally. What you you said secret place has triggered all kinds of Holy Ghost on me. <laughs> When we say secret place, we abide in the shadow of the, of the Almighty. When we get in the shadow, we're getting into, it's getting darker. Shadows are darker places. We're not taking any light with us. We're getting in the shadow. We're getting closer to him. And I went through a time, and God taught me this, and I experienced it. The closer I get to him, the less of me I'm allowed to take. Amen. Amen. The closer I get, the more of him I get, but I don't get more until I crucify Jay. And then the last of you, you get. I got to crucify Jay. Yeah. And that means that we're living, oh, I can live with the joy of the Lord is my salvation. And the fullness of, the, the fullness of joy comes in, in the fullness of yep. his presence. When we get in, in his presence, it's the fullness of joy. I celebrate. I still celebrate. I still shout, praise God. I still like to... But I'm celebrating him. Yeah. But in the moment when that, that intimacy, that's where fasting comes into prayer and, and prayer comes in. Prayer and fasting gets us into the place in that secret place close to him. Yeah. And and a lot of times when you I did a study, we won't go into it today because it's way too much, it's way too deep. <laughs> yeah, but, we're gonna be here for for the next three hours at least. <laughs> but but when you begin to study darkness in the Bible. We always think darkness is evil. Yeah. But go look up how many times God spoke out of the darkness. Mm. And it's in that darkness. I went through, I'm going to tell you this, I went through, and I've shared this with you a little bit before, I think, but over the last two years, God began to speak to me, really about three years ago, that I needed to begin to isolate myself. I had, I had to pull back from things. And this really started... Um, pre-COVID, and then it in it intensified, and in uh, uh, in all of that, I found myself needing to lay down things in my life. I found myself thinking, should I listen to that? Should I watch that? I started looking at my time, but I realized I didn't have the presence of Him the way I wanted. And it would be dry moments, but I had to find my lane. I had to find that place. And yeah. I had people, I resigned from different not-for-profit organizations, people, were, places where I was, you know, volunteering my time and, and energies and resources. And, and God said, lay it down. Yeah. And I kept laying it down. And people, some people were upset with me. Why, why? Why? And I said, I can't tell you why. God said, me lay everything down. Yeah. And I had to lay everything down. I had to let go of things so I could get into that secret place to deal with things that only me and the Lord could deal yeah. with. No, that's a really important point. And I, I want to really like focus this for even the viewers or the listeners. Like, If you get past the secret place, you've lost them. You are now on your own. It says, seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness and every other thing will be given to you. G uh, David or the psalmist says, I have set the Lord before me. Mm -hmm. You have to set, God's not going to, God's not going to come in and say like, oh, it's time for your secret place. No, you have set the Lord before you. And God's not going to set you before him. You have, set, you have to set the Lord. God's a gentle God. He's a gentleman. And like, if we do not put him first, everything else fades away. You know, if you're actually enjoying this, this uh, episode right now, I want to really 
encourage you share this with a few people we're gonna be going on for a little bit longer because the f- things are just about to get juicier that's all i can say <laughs> things are about to get amazing because what god's doing in jay's life and what god's doing in the region and what god's doing in america like i want to, i want to go into all these things so share it somebody right now and type in the comments what you have remembered up to this point you know jay you were talking about prayer you were talking about the secret place you were talking about how you're dependency in six plus hours a day in front of the altar of god like those things just put me right back to smith wigglesworth um, as you know, who Smith Wigglesworth oh, is, yes. and he's a big figure in my life, and who I studied quite a lot uh, because of his dependency on prayer. I remember one story, and I just want to share the story real quickly, where Smith was uh, had a whole entire day booked out with meetings, and he'd go into a meeting, uh, or he'd go into his office in the, in the morning. His assistant was already there. He'd get to his office, and he'd say, "I'm just gonna go to pray, and then we can send the first meeting." He'd go into his office, and the next thing you know, he walks out of his office, and he's like, "Where's the first meeting?" And his assistant looks and says, "Smith Wigglesworth or Mr. Wigglesworth. I don't know how she would call him, but um, she'd say, "Listen, you've been praying. It's already 9 p.m. It's time for you to go home." Oh wow! He comes in at nine o'clock in the morning, and he fell into prayer, and in prayer, he just lost track of time, and he woke up to like at 9 p.m., like later on at night. Uh, that's not all the way accurate with times and everything else, but just that dependency on prayer. You know, I've had multiple times where my wife would find me in my room just praying. It would be 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. She's like, what are you doing? Come to bed. And I'm like, I can't. I need him right now. And there's nothing that I can do to, like, especially like my favorite thing that I love whenever he does is if I like miss a, a certain amount of time in prayer or something, I just am going to sleep and I cannot fall asleep my soul and my spirit is like pulling Mm -hmm. me into prayer and i'm just sitting there and i just hear his gentle like tug and he's just like the silly i need you the silly i need you and following that tug following that desire of his of his heart not only my heart but his heart following that desire is just makes my secret place just explode and i feel like a lot of times we ourselves we feel that desire but we ignore that because we are so busy busyness is such a like evil thing almost because it kills the intimacy with god and a lot of times we put ministry as our focus like you had all so many things you had pastoral ministry you had uh, family ministry you had the jesus marches that were happening you had outdoor events everything was happening but yet you chose to pray why because nothing was going to happen without prayer exactly nothing's going to happen without prayer you know and, and this is where i want to go into the last part of the podcast is really what God's been doing into your heart now. Because there's been, you know, there was the Jesus parches and then uh, God was moving in all across the seas and then God was moving here. And then you were you were doing it for the past, what, I would say like, uh, I don't know how, many, how long, but you were just teaching churches and you were going around, you were stirring up evangelism ministries and doing just what the evangelist does is equips the body of the, of the saints until they come to the fullness of faith, which is which all the callings are called to do. But lately God has given you something that's reignited the, the from the beginning of the episode the communion and really for me communion was always viewed as like this holy righteous thing that you can only do once a month only in front of the pastor on sunday morning and if you touch communion any other time you're a sinner and you're worthy of death that's how i was like was raised up into it but as i got deeper the lord it was basically i want you to take this in remembrance of me not for a church service, but in remembrance of me. I remember one of the first times I was I would take communion by myself at home. I was sitting with my friends, and we were at a restaurant, and all of a sudden I just felt this drawing in my heart, go home. I need to spend time with you. And I was just like, guys, I'm sorry. I'll cover the bill. I'm out. I need to go spend time with the Lord. And we were all the way up in Sarasota. Now, we were at my house like an hour beforehand. And they were just talking with me. We would decide to go up to Sarasota to a restaurant, but yet my heart needed to go. So I just left them in Sarasota. They had their own car. I paid for the bill and I just <clears> left. <throat> I came home and I got into my house and he said, would you do communion with me? And I said, okay. So I go and I take a, and I take a piece of bread by myself. No one's at home. My wife's in Orlando for, for a conference. I go to break the bread and as I broke the bread, this, I didn't even know how to describe it, but this overwhelming presence of God fell into my house as I was beginning to break the bread. And I didn't feel pain. I didn't feel anything. I felt such sorrow that Christ's body had to be broken for me. And it just, I fell to the floor 
and I held their bread from my hands, bawling my eyes out for about 30 minutes, saying, I cannot break this. This is your body. And I sat there crying for 30 plus minutes, just saying, I cannot break this. This is your body. This is your body. I'm not breaking your body. And it just would, was such a um, revelation to me right there in that moment about his body. And as I was standing there on the floor, I remember I was just rocking back and forth. And all of a sudden, I went to do a vision. And in this vision, about 30 minutes into it, in this vision, I saw Jesus. I saw his face. I saw him carrying the cross. He was on his way to Golgotha and or Calvary. And as I saw him uh, carrying the, the cross, he fell on the floor. And he, and as he fell on the floor, he looked at me like, you know, that, that uh, passion of Christ scene. But I saw that part in the vision. And he looked at me and I saw his eyes. I saw the color of his eyes. I saw every little detail of his eyes in this vision. And in that moment, he said, Vasily, you were worth it. And the moment he said that, like this overwhelming presence just intensified. And I was able to take communion in that moment of I was worth, me having a relationship with him was worth his body being worth <clears throat> to me. Jesus said no greater man, no greater love has a man than this and lay down his life for his friends. We talk about the love of God being unconditional. And when we study out that word unconditional and we dig into it, we find out that God's love is unconditional because he puts so great a value on the life of a human being. Yeah. The value of a person is of such great value that he can only love that person without condition. And that's, that's a powerful, powerful meditation point. Yeah. You know, talking about prayer, one of the things that Smith Wigglesworth did, um, Paul Young Cho, pastor of the world's largest church in Seoul, South Korea. Uh, he, he prayed hours every day in the Spirit. Mm. And if we want to minister in the Spirit, we have to walk in the Spirit. If we're going to walk in the Spirit, we better be praying in the Spirit. And praying in tongues is praying in the Spirit. We need to worship and pray with our understanding. We need to worship and pray in the Spirit. And Jesus said those who worship Him would worship Him in Spirit and truth. Huh. So... We tie all these things together. Uh, we need to be helping people understand that the greatest prayer that they can pray is a, is a prayer in tongues. And we accomplish more in a few minutes praying in the Spirit than we'll ever pray in an hour with our understanding. Wow. Because we're praying out by the Holy Spirit, we're praying out the exact perfect will of God according to His plans and purposes. You know, I was we don't a, always I was, I was know a, what those are. I was with... Um, a person which I can say there was a, they were a complete sensationalist. And they were telling me, they said, how can you be praying in the Holy Spirit if you cannot understand what you're praying? Like, that's just babbling, what Jesus said not to do. And I said, the Bible says, uh, the Bible says that whenever you do not know what to pray, the Spirit makes intercession for you with tongues that are unknown to men. I said, and I'd rather stay with his intercession than my own. Yeah, any 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 person who reads the book of Acts and really, really wants to know about tongues, just go read the Bible. The Bible blows up all of the anti-tongue conversations very quickly. But it's important that people embrace that and pray in the Spirit. And uh, um, so where God brought us over the last year and a half, as I was digging deeper into prayer, <clears throat> I was praying a lot in the, a lot in the spirit. Um, I keep a journal. Um, you see me walking anywhere. I usually have a notebook with me. I do today, and um, because when the Holy Ghost starts talking, I want to start listening, and I usually want to start writing. What's interesting, with Sally, is I found going back to love March '88. I still have pages of my original notes when I wrote the vision, and the things God was telling me to do for four months. Well, wow. Still have the notes. And it's very important to speak. Those, those now, as people up in Indiana are telling me, they're now telling me, Jay, those are historical records. You know, the videos are historical records. The pictures are historical records. All of your notes, things you wrote down, those are historical documents of, of a revival. Um, and I never, never saw it like that. So where God has brought us now is, I, I studied in, in 2022, I did a lot of study on revival history. And I was specifically tuning into revivals 
where communion was a part of the revival. And this was, this was tremendous in, in the late 1700s, early 1800s. Uh, a lot of people may know about Cane Ridge, yeah. where 20, 30,000 people showed up for a nine-day communion fair. What they don't realize is prior to Cane Ridge, for a couple of years, there were communion events going on all over Kentucky and Virginia, and they were having four, five, six, eight, ten thousand people showing up for those. And then Cane Ridge happened, and it just blew up. But there was a momentum building, and all of those had a great impact. Uh, we won't get into revival history, but as I was reading that, I was fascinated with communion. I've always, I've always enjoyed taking communion. I've always, I've always thought that. We weren't doing enough. I'd have communion by myself. I used to carry a little communion set with me. As a pastor, I would go visit people in their homes or go to the hospital uh, and visit people. I always took communion with me. And I always had communion with people in my church. If I went to visit them, they knew I was coming. Yeah, Pastor Jay's coming at 6 o'clock. I'd go over and meet with them. We'd talk, fellowship, you know, pray, about anything they need to pray about, and we'd have communion. Wow. It's just what I did because to me, communion was extremely important. And I can tell you, Vasily, that what I have learned, what the Holy Spirit has been teaching me about communion in the last 12 months has taken me into greater depth of understanding communion than yeah. I've ever had. And all the way back in the Old Testament to Melchizedek and Abram, uh, when Melchizedek brought to him bread and wine. Yes. When, when uh, God made covenant with him and they, they brought the rams and the goats and they cut them in half. And God walked between them, establishing the torch, his of the covenant, torch of the world. His covenant. Usually, when two people were making covenant together, both of them walked between the sacrifices. That day, only God walked between Such the sacrifices. Such a deep revelation. And, and then you see Jesus, who walks alone, alone as the Lamb of God, to Calvary. Come on. God walked between the sacrifice with Abraham. Jesus walks alone between God and humanity as the Lamb of God being sacrificed. That brought new covenant through the shed blood. He said, take, eat, this is my body. Sacrificed. Drink this cup. It's my blood. He said, if you don't eat my, if, if you don't eat my flesh and you don't drink my blood, you have no life. Wow. You have no life. And that's when everybody left him. And he turned around to the 12 and he said, are you going to leave too? And they said, no, you have the words of eternal life. Peter recognized what he said. He didn't understand it. But he knew that Jesus' words were life. Yeah, even and, though they didn't understand it. And he embraced that. it. So when we take communion, Patty and I had communion this morning together. I now tell people, I, I spoke about this in Indianapolis last week. I said, you can't go take communion like we you, you need to stop doing communion in churches the way you do communion you yeah. would have a communion service sunday you're going to do it on the first sunday of the month some to do it once every week on sunday mornings i said but make it your service make teach on what communion is teach on what why do we have think about this i've had signs wonders healings and miracles following my ministry for 43 years yep and why is it that I go preach in a church, it's a full gospel, charismatic, tongue-talking, blood-washed, believing church, and half the church is sick? And they line up. They all come up in the front and get prayer. There's a biblical now, answer. They come up, some of them get healed, and some of them yeah, don't. There's a biblical answer for that. There is a biblical answer because they're taking communion, and they're not worthy of it. They yeah. have not examined themselves. They're taking it wrong. And for that reason, there's many sick and weak among you. That's the word of God. Can you please? I've I've never heard accurate teaching of examining yourself before communion. Can you please tell me more about that? Well, the challenge, we, I, I will. And the challenge of that is uh, when the pastor's up there thinking about, well, we've had our 17 minutes of 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 songs, and now we've had our three and a half minutes of announcements, and we've had 18 minutes on offerings and tithes, and uh, we've had the children come up and sing a special, and now I've got 
21 minutes and 30 seconds to preach my message, and then we're going to have communion in seven minutes and have a closing prayer and be done because we all know we have to be down to the buffet by 12.30. That mentality gets in the way of your question. Yeah. Because we don't honor God in our church services, and we do not honor him with communion. Mm. I told people in Indianapolis, now for me, it normally takes me today, because it took me and Patty about 20 minutes to do communion. It takes me usually, I, I plan on at least 30 minutes. And I'll tell you why. Because I'm holding in my hand his body. Yeah. Precious. Precious. And I'm holding in the other hand a cup with his blood. Mm. What would I be without it? I take him in my hands and I hold him. Mm. He said, pray like this, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The very fact that the second word in his prayer was Father, I meditate on the fact that I get to call El Shaddai, who sits in the Shekinah glory of his existence, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Elijah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. They called him Almighty God. But through that bread and that cup, I get to call him Father. I'm not in a hurry. I want to love him. Yeah. I want to love him. I want to tell him I love him. Yes. I'm thankful that I can hold those those things in my hand. And I take time to thank him. I take time to make sure my heart is a heart of gratitude. A heart that says, holy. My father is holy. The fact that I can come boldly I come humbly yeah. to the throne of grace. The fact that I can come to his throne at all without dying is his grace. That I can approach him. The high priest would go into the Holy of Holies sprinkling the blood before them. Mm. And if they didn't sprinkle the blood, he's going to die and get dragged out by their ankles. We have the privilege to come in to the presence and the manifested heavy essence of God's glory. Like, he, like the high priest did in the Holy of Holies. We are the Holy of Holies. I'd love to take time to teach on that, but I know we're probably running out. But we need to understand we carry the Ark of the Covenant in us as the Holy of Holies. Wow. The Aramic word that we have temple literally referenced in Aramaic in 2,000 years ago in the days of Jesus was referring to the Holy of Holies, the most holy place. Wow. Peter said, be ye holy, quoting the word of God, be holy as I am holy. When he said, let there be light, there was light. When he said, let there be earth, there was earth. When there let there be, he said, let there be. He said, be holy. He made us holy. We come in the presence of a holy God with the, the bread and the, and the blood of a new covenant. We didn't ask for it. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. We're there by his goodness and his grace and his unconditional love. He put a value on us. It says, I want you in my presence. Come into the secret place with me. Communion now in church services is with what I've experienced in the last year and a half especially. It's boring to me. Hmm. It's like, people, y'all need to take time out. You're in a hurry. You've done everything. You've done all kinds of stuff. But what have you accomplished? We need to start the services with communion. And if communion lasts for an hour or an hour and a half, then so be it. Because people will get saved. People will get healed. Backsliders and, and prodigals will come home. Because Why? Because we're not having a visitation of God. We're creating a scenario where it's his habitation. I no longer seek his presence that he shows up every once in a while when I get in the right frame of, of spiritual mind. I seek to host his glory. I want to dwell in his glory.
Mm. I can't minister effectively. I can't touch anybody else's life the way great men of God have touched lives if I don't come from within his glory, if I don't come from that shadow, that dark spot underneath his wing. I have to come from that spot next to him, holding him, holding on to him, and not letting go of him. Then I can minister. Then I can speak the oracles of God, and only from that place. That's communion. That's fellowship. That's wow. intimacy. Wow. And that's something that I believe 100% of the people listening have never heard before. Uh, you know, when I grew up and I honored my church a lot, the way that they did it, they treated it as holy. They treated the communion cup as holy. They they would dedicate a whole service for washing your feet and communion once a month on the first set, on the first Sunday of the month. And uh, they would really like, my pastor, he's really awesome at the fact that he breaks down um, the uncleanliness, like understanding what the power of the blood is, understanding what, how the um, body makes you whole, the stripes that Jesus bore on his back. He really breaks it down a lot. And uh, there's a teaching every single month, but I still have never heard this before. And this is where we need to understand, like, it's in his communion with him. It's in the communion with him that we actually understand who he is. It's not just reading the Bible. It's not just, even though that's amazing, it's not just prayer. There's a purpose of communion to even understand a deeper side of him. When you look at some of the revivals of the late 1700s, 1800s, where the communion was a major part, There was a manifestation of God's glory. People on hillsides would fall out under the power of God. No artificial falling. No, you're trained to fall in a church service. No catchers. You know, I, I told one no, pastor. No, no, no pity falling? No, no, no. I, I, I'm, I'm over it. Totally over it. Same. You know, we we, we got to get past this imitation of God's power and glory and get into his power and glory. And... Um, we 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 must learn how to honor him. We must learn how to honor God in our lives, and when we when we when we get into His presence, this happened in the Hebrides revival on the Isle of Lewis when Duncan Campbell was there preaching. And it went on for five years, and and there was such in in the in the prayers. The prayers and the communion, especially in the Kentucky revivals in, in the turn of the 1800s, there was so much prayer in the communion and the consecration of the hearts of people that sinners would just show up and start crying out to God. Mm -hmm. The prodigals would just start crying out to God, coming and running, running, screaming, running. Uh, the, the people who came to mock stopped mocking and got saved. Um, and there's a lot of stories about that, written, eyewitness stories written about what happened in, in these times. We are now at a time where God told me last July and May and then in November, I've got the exact dates, to start having communion encounters. And these communion encounters are going to be four-day events. We're working on one now, we're starting the preliminaries for here in Manatee County, Indianapolis, people in Indiana and Kentucky. I was just up there. I'm talking every day to people up there. Whole counties, whole areas, whole regions are wanting me to come up there. I'm going up there again uh, next week. I'll be up there for four or five days and meeting with a lot of, of leaders in different areas from, from Indianapolis all the way down the, to the Ohio River in, into Kentucky. And this is a move of God that's been prophesied and spoken and, and tremendous men of God have had vision of this for over 20 years. They've been talking about the end time revival would come about through communion. And I didn't know any of this. I, some of these people I'd never heard of that had, that had been saying this for 20 years. And I'm hearing this stuff. And, and my wife and I watched Saturday, we watched a, a video, um, a, a YouTube video of Lou Engle, another man, talking about what he's been hearing for 20 years. Well, quite honestly, I'd heard Lou's name before, but until you mentioned him back, you know, some months to me, I didn't know who Lou Engle was. I had to go out and find him on YouTube. Who's Lou Engle? I, yeah. You know, nothing wrong the spirit, with me or him. The Spirit of God is saying something. 
You know, and so God's speaking to different people. Well, when I, in Indianapolis at the prayer conference, laid out the vision of the communion encounters, people lined up after the meeting and come to our city, come to our area, come to our area. So we're now literally going up there and planning multiple communion encounters. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to be in a, in a church. They're going to be in an off-site neutral area. And and uh, it, it's it's... It's fascinating what all that the Lord has shown to me, and um, we'll we'll talk more about that. It's, it's it's not quite time to get into all the details. Yeah, there's that, a, there's but a lot, but the things that you've shared so far about community it just really transcends the understanding of many people. You know, uh, to wrap this podcast up, uh, I really want you to just in just a, a minute really encourage people to drive themselves into the secret place. I would encourage anybody that you, you're going to make a decision <clears throat> that you want more of God. And when you say that, oh, I really want to follow him, you're going to find out how serious you are. Proverbs 23, 26 gives us the answer. When the, it says there, my son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. What God is after is not your money, not your talent, not your skills, not your abilities, not your time. What God is after is your heart. And give him your heart. Go into the prayer room. You'll find out really quickly how much in the flesh you are when you wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning and you think, I should go pray, but I'm too tired. Don't be Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus. Don't go back to sleep. Drag yourself up and realize that you're going to pray for yourself. You're going to pray for people that need your prayers. But more than that, you're not going to go into prayer. Listen to me very carefully. You're not going to go to your prayer room to ask God for anything. You're going to go into your prayer room and you're going to put your nose in the carpet to do one thing, to seek God's face. To get there, to get in his presence, you're going to ask him, Lord, is there anything in my heart, anything, any sin, any presumptuous sin in my life that I need to repent of? Anything, because we sometimes harbor things. Unforgiveness is a big one. We, we harbor unforgiveness so, so easily, and it, it puts us in a bondage. But get before him and then ask him. And then when you ask him, is there anything in me, stop talking. Don't talk. Listen. Let him bring things up in your heart. And when he brings things up in your heart, be quick to repent. And you're going to weep. And you're going to cry. And you're going to come into a place of feeling broken and empty. And that's a good place to be. That's where he wants you to be. And then you're going to say, is there anything in my life that I do, say, go, that is offensive to you? That I just need to stop doing? Is there something you want me to do that I don't? And because I don't, that's offensive. Be honest with him and then be quiet and listen. And this isn't going to take place in an hour or 30 minutes. This is going to go on for a week. You need to get up, get out of bed early. When the, when the lights are turned off, when it's dark and nobody knows you're up, go close the door somewhere, go to the garage, get in your car, I don't care where. Get along with God where it's just you and him. Because yeah. in that place is where you can be honest and tell him what's in you. He already knows, but he wants you to repent of it. And when you get to that place, then you're going to do this. And this is the final thing. Seek his glory. Don't seek a visitation. But seek in your heart and your life to become a habitation a carrier of his glory. And as you do that, you're going to come into a presence and you're going to weep and you're going to cry because you didn't know he could be so awesome in your life. But it's in that secret place that Vasily mentioned earlier. It's in the secret place where you're going to find him and the intimacy with him that you really want. Do this and watch what God does. Amen. Amen. Guys, I want to thank you so much for watching and listening to... Um, this podcast and this episode with Jay. Jay, I really want to thank you and honor you. You're an amazing man. Thank and you. like I thank you for all the things here. that you've actually poured into my life. My life has been deeply uh, shaped and uh, transformed by the things that he has spoken to my life over the past few years. And, you know, it was in, actually in this room where my first 
moment of transformation happened from what you said about building the vision i'm working from god's vision and it was really amazing so that's a whole different story for a whole different time and it'll take another hour and a half but i thank you guys so much for watching if you guys have not already press the like press the subscribe and share this to another person so that they can also be blessed as well i believe that you guys can be blessed and jay where could they find you if they're looking for you um i've worked very hard at making myself of no reputation um <laughs> they can reach out to you uh, we are we are creating a brand new website right now powerupministries.net it's being worked on as we talk but yeah guys be blessed have a great time and i hope that you are able to step into a new and deeper personal relationship with god the kind of relationship that not only changes your mind but changes your heart be blessed